before we get started in in prayer, uh, quick quick announcement for those of you who have not yet heard, uh, Kim Bird passed away last week, uh, and so they are going to be having her memorial service in North Bend um, tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Um, so we're going to be joining in prayer for for her family for her family this morning. Would you all join me in prayer? Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity that we have to join together in worship. We thank you for the chance that we have to sing our praises to you, to be able to hear from your word, to be able to meet together with our fellow believers. God, we just ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to you this morning, that whatever you would have us to do or whoever you would have us to become, that we would be open to that, God, that we might be formed into the image of your Son. And God, we just ask that you would be with those who cannot be with us today, those who are hurting, those who are sick, those who are recovering. God, specifically, we ask that you would be with the the family of Kim Bird and the friends, those who were touched deeply by her life. God, we ask that you would be with uh, Tracy We ask that you would continue to be with Jeff as he prepares for his surgery next month. God, we ask that you would be with Donna as she recovers. God, we ask that you would bring justice and peace that follows from it, God, in our nation and in our community. God, we ask that you would continue to be with the people of Burma, with our sister church, Tigrani Karen Baptist Church, as they are affected by the events in Burma, God, and all those in the refugee camps in Thailand. God, we ask that you would continue to be with those affected by the Syrian refugee crisis and by the situation uh, that that is causing in Lebanon. We ask that you would be with our partners and our sister churches there. And God, most of all, we thank you for your son who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, now I don't usually like to call out and embarrass visitors, um, but I'm going to this morning. My friend Silas and his wife Sarah and family are here visiting from South Dakota, and um, I just wanted you to know that we've been friends uh, since college, and so if you are looking for somebody to tell stories on me, he's got about as many as anybody. So... um, and just a reminder to you all as you do that, I've only told him nice things about you all. So, <laughs> give him a mic. <clears throat> all right. When I was a kid, I had many different types of jobs that I wanted to have. But in the third grade, I did a project about inventors. And I wrote this small book with all these different inventors and inventions, and I loved it. I thought it was brilliant. Um, I think to some extent I identified with mad scientists and crackpot inventors. And I thought, you know what? I see myself in that a little bit. Maybe that's what I could do when I grow up. Is there somewhere where I can study to be a crackpot inventor? And I didn't find that, and so I became a pastor instead. But... Uh, But that stuck with me, that love for invention and that love for finding new ideas and unique solutions to problems. And some of my absolute favorite inventions as I was studying were accidental inventions where somebody was trying to invent something helpful and useful and failed miserably and accidentally invented something else entirely. Now, these are all over the place if you're looking for them. For instance, Velcro. 
Velcro was actually invented by a man who was running through a field and got a whole bunch of sand burrs or stickers all over his pant legs. And as he got back to his house and angrily spent hours picking sand burrs out of his pant legs, let the reader understand, if you've done this, this is a pain, huge pain. And he thought, you know what? But what if we had this on purpose? And so he invented Velcro, something that would stick when you wanted it to and had to be peeled apart in order to fasten and unfasten something. Or, or sticky notes. Sticky notes were invented by somebody at 3M who was attempting to make a strong adhesive and failed miserably and made an adhesive that would stick for a few minutes, but then if you pulled on it, it would just peel right off. And they said, yeah, but what if we did it on purpose? And then they invented sticky notes. My favorite, though, my favorite is chocolate chip cookies. Now, see, it is difficult, almost painful for me to realize that there was a time in human history where there were not chocolate chip cookies. I have a weakness, a weakness for cookies and chocolate chip cookies especially. Um, ask Deb Fenton about that. She knows. She makes cookies all the time and she always has to set aside a little stash for me. But somebody was making chocolate cookies and the kind of chocolate that they mixed in didn't melt during the process of making the cookies. And so instead, there were just all these chunks of chocolate in the cookies. And again, they said, okay, yeah, but what if we did this on purpose? And voila, chocolate chip cookies. Now, these are all times when there was an unintended consequence. When somebody had been trying to do something and then it had this consequence or this effect that they could not have predicted had no idea why it had happened, but it ended up being something positive. But as we know, unintended consequences are not always positive. There are things that we do, things that we try to do, and we think we know what's going to happen, and we think we know what the effects are going to be, and then it just goes terribly, terribly wrong. We're going to be going through a few different parts of the book of Acts, here over the next few weeks. And we're going to be talking about a dangerous gospel in the book of Acts. Because so many times in the book of Acts, people are preaching the gospel, people are bringing the word of God to people, and we think we know what the effect of that is going to be, right? It ought to be something good and something positive. Scripture says that you cast your bread on the waters and it will come back to you. That we think that if we send something good out into the world, there's going to be this positive effect. That's not always the case. So many times the preaching of the gospel is accompanied by anger. It's accompanied by violence. It's accompanied by all of these negative consequences, these negative side effects that there's no way, no way people would have predicted. And today specifically, we're going to be reading about Stephen and Stephen preaching the gospel to people. Now, spoiler alert, Stephen dies at the end of his sermon. And if you have never died at the end of a sermon, then that means you're doing better than Stephen. <clears throat> but the question is, why? Something that seems to us like a good thing, the gospel, which in fact means good news. Why, why would Stephen be killed at the end of a gospel sermon? If, if Stephen is preaching the gospel, if Stephen is bringing the word of God to people, why would it have these awful, awful consequences for him? Why was the gospel dangerous? And is the gospel still dangerous? dangerous? And if not, why not? And if so, how? So we're going to start out in Acts chapter 7 today. We're not going to read the, the entire sermon because I think I'm contracted to only preach one sermon per service. And if I start doing two at a time, we might start 
having people fall asleep. So we're going to start out with verse, uh, verse 42, Acts chapter 7 and verse 42. Now to set this up a little bit, Stephen had been arrested and he had been called before the authorities and he had been charged, he had been charged with blasphemy and he had been charged with attacking the temple and the law. The, uh, the religious leaders at the time said he's been attacking the temple, he's been attacking the law, that's all he's been doing with his preaching. And so uh, the, one of the authorities basically asked him, they said, is this true what they're saying about you? And Stephen was a preacher, and so of course he couldn't give them a straight answer and just say yes or no. He had to tell them a story, and so he did. He started telling him the whole history of the Hebrew people, and then got to the point where he was telling them eventually the story of Jesus. But here in the middle where we pick him up, Stephen is telling the story of idolatry in God's people and then moves on to the effect that that had. So here we'll start in verse 42 of chapter 7. But God turned away from them and handed them over to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, did you offer to me slain victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? No, you took along the tent of Moloch and the star of your God, Rephan, the images that you made to worship. So I will remove you beyond Babylon. Our ancestors had the tent of testimony in the wilderness, as God had directed when he spoke to Moses, ordering him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our ancestors, in turn, brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our ancestors. And it was there until the time of David, who found favor with God and asked that he might find a dwelling place for the house of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built a house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made with human hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you are forever opposing the Holy Spirit, just as your ancestors used to do. Which, <coughs> excuse me, which of the prophets did your ancestors not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the righteous one, and now you have become his betrayers and murderers. You are the ones that received the law as ordained by the angels, and yet you have not kept it. When they heard these things, they became enraged and ground their teeth at Stephen. But filled with the Holy Spirit, he gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they covered their ears and with a loud shout, all rushed together against him. Then they dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning Stephen, he prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out in a loud voice, Lord, do not hold their sin against him. When he had said this, he died. May God bless the reading and hearing of just a portion of God's word. And so this sermon and the effects that this sermon had begs the question, why? What was it about the sermon that Stephen preached that was so dangerous? What was it that the people were so afraid of, that the people were so angry about? And I think it was because this sermon challenged a number of things that were most important to those people. It challenged a number of underlying assumptions. It challenged a number of things that were absolutely foundational to how they saw themselves. And the gospel, the gospel has a tendency to do that. First of all, it challenged their idolatry. It challenged the people's tendency to worship the created thing, rather than the creator. This is a consistent theme throughout the Hebrew Bible. 
The people of God are always being told, do not worship the created thing, only worship the creator. Do not worship nature. Do not worship the things that are made. Do not worship our constructions. Do not worship our institutions. Do not worship nature. Do not worship people. Do not worship the things that we have made. Only, only worship God. And this is one of those themes that runs all the way through Scripture and yet gets violated time and time again. When I was young, I could never understand this. How was it that the people of God turned away so quickly? They were released from slavery in Egypt, and then they go and they make an idol. And they're told to worship God alone, and then 40 years later, here they are, worshiping idols again. And then I studied history. And then I myself had issues that I would turn back to time and time again. And I see our tendency as people, as humans, to worship what we have made rather than the God who made us. I've seen our tendency to hold up as ultimate or to lay as our foundation things that we have constructed, institutions and parties and groups rather than God who made us. This is challenged anew throughout the Hebrew Bible. And it's challenged new in this time, challenged by Jesus and then challenged by Stephen. Because the implication, the implication for Stephen is that the things that he is challenging, this idolatry that he is challenging, has become a new idol. Stephen's sermon was dangerous because it was challenging idolatry. Stephen's sermon was also dangerous because it was challenging the temple. How many times, how many times was Jesus, was Jesus accused of challenging the temple? He was called blasphemous for saying, you think this temple is ultimate, but tear it down. In three days, I will raise the temple up again. And of course, he was talking about himself. He wasn't talking about the building alone. How many times do we confine God to a structure that has been created by humans? How many times do we box God in to something that we have made or something that we have created? And so Stephen challenges that. He says, the most high does not live in houses made by human hands. And then he quotes the prophets saying, heaven, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. God does not live in houses made by human hands. But how many times do we confine God to what we have made? And why do we do that? We do that because it's easier. We do that because it is simpler. We want a God that we can control. We we want a God that we can predict. We want a God that we can manipulate. We would never say it that way. But we want a God that is predictable for us. We want to be able to pray a prayer and get the thing that we're asking for. We want to be able to show up in a building and know that God was there before us. And we most of all want to know that God is not going to show up in places that we did not expect God to be. We don't want to walk outside the doors and find God outside the walls of this building. We want a God that we can control. We want a God that we can predict. One of my favorite lines in the Chronicles of Narnia is someone asking about the lion Aslan. And they say, is he safe? And the answer is, of course he's not safe, but he's good. God is the same way. God is not found only in a building. God is not found or constrained by our constructions, by the things that we have made. Wherever we go, wherever we walk, God will meet us there. God was there before us. God will be there after us. It is more difficult to follow a God that we cannot predict, who shows up in unexpected places and acts in unexpected ways. We want to be able to confine God to the temple to confine confine God to the church. And so Stephen's sermon 
where he confirms that God most high does not dwell in houses made by human hands, challenged the people of the time. And last, Stephen's sermon challenged the law. Stephen's sermon challenged the law. Now, did Stephen go out and say, do not follow the law? Or did Stephen say, this part of the law, you don't really need to worry about that part. Stephen didn't do that, and neither did Jesus. In fact, when Jesus was accused of not following the law, what did he say? He said, I have not come to abolish the law. I haven't come to break the law. I haven't come to do away with the law. I have come to fulfill it. And then after he said that, he would go and act in ways that challenged the way that people were reading and following the law. One of the most consistent challenges made to Jesus himself was that he was a Sabbath breaker. They said, we have laws against this sort of thing. The law says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And Jesus didn't say, no, you don't have to do that. He said, the way that you have understood that is missing the point. People's interpretation of Sabbath keeping, people's interpretation of scripture, people's interpretation of the law were shown to be faulty or missing. They were shown to be inadequate. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. The way that he followed the law often angered people. This is actually, to me, one of the most beautiful parts of the Baptist faith and tradition is the, the principle of Bible freedom. That each of us have a responsibility to read the Bible for ourselves. Each of us have the responsibility to interpret the Bible for ourselves and to decide based on Scripture, what is God calling me to? What is God calling us to? And we're not always going to agree about it, right? Wherever you have 10 Baptists, you have 12 opinions or more if I'm the Baptist. But there is this responsibility that we each have to read Scripture anew, to discover what God is calling us to, and in community, in study together with one another, to seek out, to discern what God is calling us to. And this happens in all sorts of places, not primarily at 1015 on Sunday morning, because this is me talking to you all. And sometimes I like to think that the Holy Spirit has alighted on me as a dove and said, listen to John, everything that he says is true. But that's my arrogance talking and not my faith. It's not true. God has not given me all the correct answers and other people none of the correct answers. I assume, I know that there's things I'm wrong about. I know there's times I miss the point or I miss the bigger picture because I'm human. And so we get together and we study together and we learn together. On Tuesday morning at our Bible studies, we talk together, we sharpen one another, we disagree, we agree, we pray, we ask, what is God calling us to based on this? In our Sunday schools, in our Bible studies, we study together because that's our responsibility. This is how we interpret. This is how we read. No one person has all the answers. No one person gets it right all the time. We have the freedom. We have the responsibility to interpret for ourselves what the Bible says. And so Stephen challenged the idolatry of his day. Stephen challenged the temple and people's insistence on confining God to the temple. And Stephen challenged the law. Not the law itself, but people's interpretations of it. And people's tendency to hold their interpretation up as truth. Because I read it this way, because I see it this way, that must be what God has called us all to. Stephen challenged that. And so I ask today, is the gospel a challenge to our lives? Is the good news a challenge to how I do things? Is the gospel, a challenge to my own idolatries, to my own tendency to follow blindly or unthinkingly people or groups of people, constructions, things that we have made. 
Do I have a tendency to confine God, to expect God to only show up at certain times and in certain ways? Do I have a tendency to hold up my own interpretation of Scripture as normative, as what everyone ought to believe and do and think? Is the gospel challenging me in those ways? Is the gospel challenging us in those ways? Is the good news a challenge to our own lives? So my invitation to you this morning is to reflect on what kind of a challenge the gospel might be to our own lives. Because Jesus called us to a life of discipleship. Jesus called us to a life of following, to a life of challenge. And so if the good news never challenges what we already believed or what we already thought, that is not the gospel. That is not Jesus talking if he never disagrees with what we already thought. How is the gospel a challenge to how we're already living? On April 9th, 1945, in Nazi Germany, a pastor named Dietrich Bonhoeffer was executed by the Nazis. Now, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had been an influential figure in what was called at the time the Confessing Church. See, most churches in Nazi Germany became part of the Nazi party. They followed along and would have the Nazi flags flying in their buildings. They would uh, read announcements from the party, from their pulpit. And they largely did not offer a challenge to the atrocities going on at that country in that time. And yet there were a few pastors and a few churches who stood against it. Dietrich Bonhoeffer was one. Now for a time, he was able actually to leave Nazi Germany during some of the most, uh, uh, most deadly bloodiest times. He was able to leave the country and he came to New York for a time, spent time at a church in Harlem and studied at Union Seminary, taught some classes there for a time. But he felt that it was his calling to return. He said, I believe that my calling is not here where it is safe. I believe that my calling is with my church and with my people. And so he went back and eventually was killed during his time there, right before the end of World War II. Now, one of his most famous books is called The Cost of Discipleship. And one of the most famous lines in The Cost of Discipleship is this. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Jesus calls a man, he bids him come and die. When we are called to discipleship, when we are called to new life in Christ, we are not always called to ease and comfort. We are not called to believe what we believed before. We are not called to behave as we behaved before. We are called to pick up our cross and follow Jesus. And that is going to be a challenge. It's going to challenge the ways that we have done things. It is certainly going to challenge the world and the culture around us. It is going to challenge the groups that we are part of. It is going to challenge our friendships. It is going to challenge our relationships with our families. The gospel is going to be a challenge. But that is our calling. That can and will be an unexpected consequence of following Jesus. Now, does that mean it is all going to be doom and gloom and difficulty and hard times? No, God has also called us to a life of joy and a life of meaning and a life of purpose. And so we can and should have joy even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of our work, even in the midst of our difficulty. But when Jesus calls a person, he bids them come and die. He bids them to a new life that happens on the other side of crucifixion and resurrection. As the Apostle Paul said, I want to know Christ and the power of his rising to share in his suffering and to be conformed to his death. G.K. Chesterton famously said, Jesus did not come that we might not suffer 
but that our sufferings might be like his. That is redemptive. That is bringing new life and new purpose and new meaning to us and to those around us. Would you all join me in prayer this morning? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God, we thank you for this day. And we thank you for your sacrifice for us. God, we thank you, what you for what you laid down for us. And we thank you for the new life that that brings. God, we recognize that the gospel is often a challenge to our lives. It often brings difficulty and hardship. God, we ask for the courage to follow you even through that. But God, we also know that you can bring us joy in the midst of our suffering. And so we ask for joy. We ask for new life. We ask for resurrection. We ask to be raised from the ashes to a new life in you and to the joy and to the purpose and to the peace that comes with that. God, we love you and we trust you and we thank you for everything you do for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. So may the love of God and the peace of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. And may you too go to love and serve your God by loving and serving your neighbors. Go in peace.